are right now living through the time of the sixth mass extinction. And many of us are trying to deal with a deep sadness about it. A human response to sadness is normally grief, but it seems many of us are either beyond grief somehow or don't really know how to grieve. So instead it can turn into either depression or like shopping. You say in your books that grieving is a skill, something to be learned. And maybe it's a skill that we're not taught very well in this modern world. So what would you suggest one might do to learn about grieving or to find within oneself a better response to these troubled times other than being depressed or going shopping? Mm -hmm. Or going shopping while you're depressed, which might be the worst combination there is. <laughs> well, um, the first thing I'd suggest is this. Um, when you are possessed of a fundamental, almost a primordial misanthropy, and I think the current regime is deeply possessed of such a, such a thing. In other words, when your view as a human being is that the principal fault line, the principal uh, insult to the natural order of things is human, the likelihood that you will acquire your capacity to grieve over the thing is one of the early and probably permanent casualties of misanthropy. That's the first thing. Second thing is, misanthropy is not conscience. The view that everything that's wrong with the world can be, can be attributed to humans, it's not that it's faulty. It's that fundamentally... It's not what conscience produces, okay? Conscience produces understanding, but misanthropy is not understanding. Misanthropy is another solution, mongered thing, generated by itself. Misanthropy, our current regime of misanthropy, is our, our way of manifesting self-absorption, self-hatred, is another form of self-absorption, you see. So, uh, you will never come to grief with an understanding of primordial trespass attributed to humans, irreversible sacrilege attributed to humans. This is not to say that you're not, that it's not understandable you come to the conclusion that humans are what's wrong with the world. But there's nothing in the world that seems to have come to that conclusion. Only us. Now there's something to be learned from the observation that there seems to be no life form in this world that has it out for us the way we have it out for us. And we turn that self-annihilation instinct into a principle and imagine that as us in a fit of conscience. I don't think any of those things accurately describe the current dilemma. So, we all know that anger is a much more accessible emotion and a much more enabling emotion than sadness. We know that it's more compelling, more attractive. It works. It works quickly. It has immediate upside. It's a it's friendly to the glandular life of a human being. Sadness, by, by comparison, seems, you know, bordering on the disabling. But grief is neither of those things. What grief is, is a willingness to recognize that the limita not just a willingness to recognize, but to abide by the recognition that the limitations that are entrusted to us are not just for our sake, but they're for the sake of the world and of life too. Our limitations, including our mortality, is not where we depart from the natural order of things. It's where we meet it. It's the only solution we never would have come up with on our own. You see, we know that everywhere the human beings are successful in this world, the world suffers directly as a result. So our limitations are there to curtail our capacity for success. Mm 
It's so counterintuitive, but you might go on a, out on a limb and say, for God so loved the world, the world now, that God made humans fallible, short-sighted, and short-lived to contain the carnage in part. And so the, the realization that our shortcomings, sorry, our, our, um, the shortness of our allotment and our frailties and our undoings, all of these things, uh, rather than being punishments, are ways by which we can engage life and reacquire something of our old animus understandings. The reason that grief endorses that whole realization is because it's counterintuitive. It's not something we would seek. It's not something that seems to deliver what we're seeking. The beautiful thing about grief is that it is our citizenship document when it comes to life. It's proof to life that we belong the fact that we don't endure is how we belong. And the root condition of belonging is longing. Etymologically, that's exactly what it means. Our capacity to long after living longer is what we have instead of being able to live longer for the sake of the world. And sadly, the generations are quickly coming where we are doing something about that limitation. We're extending it. And we do so, and we're compromising our humanity by doing so. And we're undermining our capacity for grief literacy by doing so. Mm. So the human striving to become the gods instead of being in a relationship with the gods with no endings and no limitations, do you think there's a, there's a possibility somehow that this striving could end up having had a place in the, quote, natural order of things? Hmm. I, think, I think the question inside the question, if I'm hearing it right, is whether the human striving after divinity is part of being human. And if it's not there, I'm going to insert it there in my answer anyhow. And uh, let me begin there then. You know, we have in the English language, which is such a mongrel and, and so hard to fathom, uh, if, particularly if you're not a native speaker, we have two words that are seem synonymous. There's a word human and there's the word humane. And the only difference on the surface of it is an E at the end of humane. So here's a question. If these are synonyms, why do we have both of them? If they, do this, if they say the same thing, surely we don't need two. Well, they don't say the same thing. Uh, the first one is, a, you could say, a root condition of being a biped. Um, that's just, there's nothing to be done. There's a, there's a scheme, uh, a kind of structural scheme, and uh, we more or less obey it almost all the time. That's human. Uh, and humanists are fairly sure that there's nothing we can do to alienate ourselves or disenfranchise ourselves from being human. If that were true, we wouldn't need the word humane because the word humane describes a circumstance that allows a real possibility that humans from time to time, or more frequently than that, are capable of transgressing upon their humanity. So the word humane allows the, the drastic possibility that humans aren't human all the time. F far from it, you could say. So then is the striving after divinity an expression of being human or is it a transgression upon our humanity? My guess is it's closer to the latter and here's why I say that. 
I'm listening to an interview years ago uh, on the what I call the mothership here, the CBC Canadian Broadcasting Company. And uh, <clears throat> it's a follow-up interview to a guy who had a huge <clears throat> blockbuster of a book come out about the short, something like the short history of humanity as if we need another short history of that epic. And so this is a follow-up. He's written a new book that is about the near future, what's what's coming soon. The interviewer says to him, what do you see coming on the horizon? And the author says, well, they're working on a eternity pill. I don't think he called it that, but I'm calling it that. Whereby if you take the pill, uh, he said, you won't have to die. My translation of that, you won't be able to die. Which is a little different emphasis and a different understanding. And he said, um, <clears throat> the consequence of that will be that um, we'll have to find a new word to describe those people who won't have to die by virtue of this pharmaceutical uh, appendage. And the interviewer was, uh, I think, taken aback. He said, what, well, what would you call us then? That being the case. And the, uh, the author said, I think you'd have to call us divine. Now, every time I've told that story in the good old days when there was a, a live public opposite me to hear it, there were a lot of gasps and a lot of groans and a lot of um, uh, anger, frankly, and uh, uh, recoil at the, th at the prospect that humans could approach the divine in some fashion and even be called such a thing. It reminds me of, uh, obviously, the Tower of Babel story and perhaps remind the people listening of the same thing. The reason I'm mentioning it to you in answer to your question is because if you reflect for a moment at what, what involuntarily comes to you when you think God, when you think gods, when you think divinity, holiness, things of this kind, um, the list of human attributes is unlikely to arise when you think these thoughts. What you have instead is something like um, eternal, uh, the source of all things. Well, I, I don't need to go down the list. Everybody has one. And so the point would be then, given the story about the author, that human's capacity to be human depends on their ability not to be divine, depends on their ability and their willingness not to be divine, not to approach the seat of eternality, you could say. Another way of saying this is the root of our humanity seems to lie in our foibles and our frailties, in our limits and our endings. And if that's true, we occupy our humanity at the expense of our capacity to imagine otherwise. Now, strangely, that's a package deal for humans. We can imagine ourselves out of our humanity, but our imagining itself has enough limitation and frailty in it that our humanity is revisited upon us, even in the act of imagining ourselves out beyond its limits. Mm, thank you. Yeah, it's um, it's just can be for me at least. It, it can make me feel hopeless sometimes when I feel about, uh, think about the Elon Musk's of the world trying to get us to Mars and yes and the eternity pills and and all the rest of it. Yes. There's just a part of me that goes, well, maybe that's the way it was meant to be. Maybe we're headed somewhere that we're supposed to be headed, and then. Afterward, just like, for example, um, so I'm divorced, and at the time of going through the the divorce, that was the worst time of my life. Mm -hmm. But now, looking back at it, that was what made it possible for what came after it. So, I guess the hopeful part of me is thinking that this is something like an ordeal that we go through, and something else is on the other side. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know. That's not a question, but you feel free to comment it anyway. Sure. Uh, well, 
you know, hope is, a, is an understandable affliction. It's an understandable um, frailty that we have. Uh, hope, even as you described it here, it, it's clearly a coping mechanism masquerading as a, as a general affirming sensibility. It's not really what hope does. Hope is not nearly as affirming as its spokespeople make it out to be. Even in the example that you gave, not the, not the divorce example necessarily, but the idea that you can derive a sense of meant to be from what happened. I mean, visit the top five mayhems of the 20th century and then try to make a case that this is what was supposed to happen. See, that's the language that's the, that I think blessedly causes you to pause. Supposed to has some kind of scheme that is self-fulfilling and in a sense necessary. That kind of necessity, when it's attributed to, to the mayhem that humans perpetrate upon each other, is a real slippery and tragic slope and very seductive. So um, I used to work with uh, kids who were dying and their families. And uh, one of the things I, I made a point of articulating in, about that work in uh, Die Wise was the notion that it wasn't true, actually, that, that the parents' greatest torment and agony was that their young child was dying. As monstrous as that sounds to say, but it wasn't. And I could tell that it wasn't after a while. They had a sense of grievance that tragedy did not eclipse. And their grievance came from the understanding that their child was being fundamentally deprived of a basic human right called a full life. Now, if you just investigate that for five seconds, you realize that one of the things they're inadvertently confessing is the idea that a seven-year-old dying of leukemia, by definition, has not had a full life and will not have one. Which begs the question, how old do you have to be to qualify for having a full life? And why is it that upon the age of qualification, the instant consequence of acquiring the full life is acquiring the grievance that comes with the idea that this is your entitlement. Because I never heard a seven-year-old lament about what they'd never get to do as they were dying. Never. It's, it's, a, it's com fascinating, compelling, ultimately heartbreaking that we're led down the garden path of entitlement as a way of contending with what we can't change. And, and this is the book of supposed to, opened wide open, and people quoting from it as if it were a biblical source. This is what's supposed to happen. Children are not supposed to die. Everybody gets a full allotment. And, you know, you have to ask yourself the question, where does this supposed to come from? Is it an accurate depiction of the way things actually are? the supposed to of things. Generally speaking, the, you know, quoting from the book of supposed to is an act of uh, intolerance. And it's an attempt to affix an upside on something, that uh, a benefit to something, a kind of uh, a divine mandate to something uh, in the name of trying to live through it. Maybe there's another way to do that, without agreeing that it couldn't have been any other way, right? I'm not, again, I'm not saying that uh, divorces uh, between people who can't find a way to be together is somehow sacrilegious or anything of the kind. All I'm saying is the instinct to attribute a meant-to-be quality to stuff that happens um, moves in the direction of uh, certifying every event as a purpose-driven, uh, uh, co uh, meaning-laden consequence. And I'm not sure that a lot of what we do can be understood that way. 
Instead, it could be understood like this. Etymology always um, is helpful in the context of wondering about these things aloud. So we have the word awake, which we, you and I may have spoken about in prior conversations. In, it's an old English word. The A in front is a preposition, and it answers the question uh, of what, or I, th I think that's fairly close, uh, pertaining to something like this. And then we have the root word wake, which is a word that in contemporary English we only use in two contexts. One of them is the thing that happens if you have enough friends to attend to you postmortemly, meeting, drinking, and lying <laughs> to a certain extent about you and your life. At least you're the beginning of the meeting. <laughs> you may not be the end of it, though. Uh, and the other uh, meaning of wake is that thing that issues out behind you as you make your way through through water or through air or through life. So the condition of being awake is the condition of being gathered into that web of consequence that fans out behind everything you did and didn't do and said and didn't say and meant and didn't mean and, and so on. It's a, it's a drastic condition to be awake. And... Uh, you know, the, the, the sound upon awakening has, has been typically described by the seekers as hallelujah, as amen, as at long last love or things of this kind. Uh, its apologists make that sound routinely and promise it to the rest of us. But in a time like ours in particular, the sound upon awakening clearly is a sob. It's a gasp and a sob, and there's something involuntary and tragic about coming to wakefulness in a time that seduces you otherwise. So, and I, I think the, the notion that um, everything that happens is meant to be is a kind of seduction otherwise. I'm going to stay momentarily in the area we might label hope, for lack of a better word, um, mm -hmm. and try to make something of an arc from the past to the future and see how that goes. Um, here's the question. Uh, in which way do you think it's relevant, or do you think it's relevant to wonder about humanity's deep past, like we've done today? in order to imagine a better future in terms of ecology and human sanity? I don't think that... it's That's not my purpose, to imagine a better day. I mean, I think we do that involuntarily. I don't think we need to strategize. I think the imagining of a better day is a kind of... This is going to sound very severe, uh, but uh, I maybe I have a moment to take the edges off the severity. Um There's something about hopefulness. Uh, there's something about the insistence on imagining a better day that is borders on the gutless amongst humans, I would say. In other words, imagining a better day is one of the things we employ to get through a day that's not the better day that we have in mind. Okay. Is this constitute working on behalf of a better day to be able to imagine one? And to use the imagining as a kind of grief bypass to short circuit our deep uh, and sometimes involuntary uh, participation in the drastic days. Because that's what I see happen. That's what I see hope becoming every time it's turned to. Similarly, it seems to be what happens when people turn to the notion of... Um, Oh, I'm just I'm blanking on the word because I never use it. Healing. There's another one. Uh, healing is so often employed as a kind of elegant form of amnesia. You know, to get on the other side of the bad old days. The last time I checked, which was probably uh, earlier in this conversation, the bad old days are as instructive as any imagining we can come up with 
about a better day. In fact, you could go further and imagine that our capacity to imagine a better day is reliant entirely upon our full participation in the drastic days. That's where the vision comes from. That's where the sense of alternative comes from. Carl Jung, who uh, managed a lot during the course of his long life, had an observation, well, many, of course, but the one I'm thinking of now goes something like this. If I am forced to choose, and oftentimes I am, I would rather be whole than be good. This is an amazingly articulate distinction that he makes in this very simple uh, advocacy. One of the things that I think he's asking us to do is reimagine where we think our capacity to be good comes from. More or less involuntarily, most people seem to come up with the idea that being good is a consequence of eliminating all the ways you could be bad, at least managing them in a severe and totalitarian fashion, such that they appear so irregularly that you could be mistaken <laughs> for a good person. Now, he's, he's suggesting otherwise, of course. He's saying your ability to be good isn't predicated on how much, how successful you are at banishing the, quote, bad parts of you. He's saying the ability to be good is a subset of the ability to be whole. And being whole includes everything. There is no room for Puritanism in wholeness. There's no room for the intolerance of, of sort of moral uh, Puritanism and ethical Puritanism. Why? Because when you blow it, when you make your mistakes, when you transgress, as we do, the news that comes back to you as a consequence of the transgression has more educating power for how you will carry yourself subsequently than any of your successes do. And I don't pretend to understand why that arrangement is so. I know from myself, uh, and I'm not extrapolating from my own little example here, but certainly for me as a, someone who's had a public life for 15 or 20 years, from time to time, I'm on the receiving end of, you know, opprobrium and, and condemnation and criticism and so on. And for some peculiar reason that I can't admire in myself, <clears throat> those responses, uh, they, go, they go in a deeper way inside me than any of the acceptance or admiration goes. And I'm not advocating that, but I'm, I'm noticing it. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm taking from this the distinct possibility that I tend to chart my course in response to the transgressions attributed to me and the consequences thereof than I do from the rather uh, placid waters of general acceptance and, and uh, affirmation. And, uh, you know, without seeking them, they appear with some frequency. I overstep or overstate or, or worse. And... Uh, and I come to an understanding of the consequence that I've put into motion by something that I didn't understand. I was fully capable of saying it, but I didn't understand the, the wake that might ensue. And then I have to, you know, respond and integrate the understanding and the consequences and, and in so doing, try to live a life that, that threatens to become whole from time to time. So cultivating wholeness is one thing if you're talking about a personality or a character type, but it's a whole other orientation when you're thinking about, I think, what the relationship might be between um, uh, the willingness to fully inhabit the drastic days and the insistence on being hopeful as a precondition for being able to inhabit the drastic days. Uh, it's, it's very clear that hope, by definition, is pretty hostile to the present tense. In other words, 
you and I are talking right now. Oh, I guess I'm doing most of the talking, but, but we're going back and forth to some extent. And there's no requirement on either of us to hope that we're going back and forth, having a conversation. In other words, we're able to do this very thing minus any hope that we're doing this very thing. And I don't know how plain or obvious or unnecessary that sounds as an utterance, but I think it's, it's worthwhile remembering that we proceed most of the time without hope, and hope intrudes in our capacity to proceed. It doesn't facilitate it. It intrudes upon it. And so I, I've tried to cultivate a hope-free life for the most part. <laughs> and um, occasionally it, it might dip into hopelessness. In other words, occasionally I might uh, have a sense of, you know, human transgression upon the natural world that's so implacable that it's, it's frankly a punishing realization and a damning one at the same time. And I don't say for one second that it's easy to, to face and to fess up to what humans continue to do to each other, and I guess especially now to the world. But looking at that circumstance with hope does not seem to enable any of us to proceed otherwise. It's a hope seems to be a kind of grief bypass. Grief, on the other hand, seems to be something that enables us to proceed without the illusion that doing so automatically betters us. The last thing I'd say about it is... Um, and I hope these answers aren't going on too long, but uh, too late now. Uh, there's a, uh, a Irish author, Samuel Beckett. And most people have certainly heard of him, at least. And Mr. Beckett wrote a book uh, towards the end of his life called uh, I Can't Go On, I'll Go On. It's a brilliant title uh, because, uh, among other things, and it's a bit of Irish trickery in the title, but it says something like this. If I were to slightly transliterate it, it would be, I have an ob obligation to go on not being able to. I have an obligation to go on not being able to. And the fullness of that confession is enabling and human. And the insertion of hope into that equation short circuits it fundamentally and I think disables you to the point where you can only go on if you can go on. That is, if you're hopeful about the possibility. And Beckett's, you know, singular bravery in the title is his willingness to go on not being able to. And I find myself uh, t temporarily occasionally an honorary member of that tribe. Wow. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you. And don't worry about the lengths of the answer. Let them be <laughs> as they are. Okay. Um, in the book Ishmael, in the book Ishmael that we spoke about uh, earlier, there's a story from Ishmael's pupil of how he as a teenager, wrote an essay about this boy, Hans, I think his name was, okay. who grew up in Germany a few generations removed from the Second World War. Mm -hmm. But in this essay, it was Hitler who had won the war mm -hmm. and the world had turned into the Third Reich. And this um, Hans character, he always had a feeling that something was wrong in the world that he was born into, but he was unable to put his finger on exactly what it was, immersed in its culture as he was. And that little story has really helped me understand why it can be so difficult to see clearly the troubles of the culture and context that you're a part of. So, for example, if I grew up in a culture where clear cutting is how we get timber and paper, mm -hmm. I might feel in my gut that something's terribly wrong here when I see a clear cut, but I'm not necessarily going to act on that feeling. I'll likely brush it aside because, well, this is how we get timber and paper. It seems to me that you are very good at being able to put your finger and your pen 
on the troubled aspects of our so-called modern life. You show it to the rest of us, as if from an outside perspective. But you were born into this mess too, right? So how is it that you seem to be able to step out of that fog and see it like from a distance? Well, it's a very kind attribution that you make to to imagine that I'm able to step outside of the fog in order to uh, say something about the fog. I'm not sure that the ability that you've ascribed to me comes from me being somehow free or relieved of the obscuritanism and and uh, and troubles that uh, would appear to a plague my fellows on either side. So let me go back to the first part of uh, your your question. You know, one of the greatest dilemmas that humans have is being victorious. This is very clear. That's the dystopia that you were describing there. Um, you know, in the case of the Third Reich, uh, the, the reason that the kid would have had an extraordinarily difficult time coming to his senses, is how I'd put it, is because Germany had prevailed in the war, you see. And there's nothing worse than winning for collapsing your capacity for you know, uh, disciplined inquiry into the status quo. Uh, losing is much more uh, uh, a midwife to that kind of ability than winning is. When humans win, some part of their capacity for critical inquiry collapses. That's what the Roaring Twenties was, I think, in Europe. And that's what, uh, you know, the 50s was, rock around the clock and all of that stuff in in North America. <clears throat> we're not winning now, though. The problem is we're prevailing. And there's a, there's a subtle difference between the two. That, that means in our heart of hearts, we know now that our proliferation across the planet in terms of our numbers and in terms of our, our MO, our way of proceeding, is prevailing against virtually all of the old obstacles to it that humans were contending with through the eons. And secretly, or maybe not so secretly, we know at the same time that we are losing by winning. That we that the thing that was supposed to happen as a consequence of us being on top of things is not happening. We are, if you could put it this way, on top of ourselves. We are forever contending with the consequences of trying to minimize the consequences. So it's a kind of, it's a kind of carnival of, of uh, misapprehension is, is what the late 20th century and now the new century seems to be. And there's nothing about the plague that has changed that. I wish, I wish it had. I was not very secretly looking forward uh, in a grim sense to the co course correction that a worldwide pandemic invited us to. And it became very clear very quickly, and it's true, it seems very clear unto the present moment, that there's no willingness for course correction that we insist on being defeated as an alternative to being persuaded. Persuaded means we choose to stop. Defeated means there is no choice. And this is the difference between slavish obedience and courage. The thing about courage is that, and people have attributed courage to me very kindly, but I think mistakenly. Here's why. Uh, the way courage seems to function, as best as I can tell, is that, in fact, you have a choice. In fact, you could make the choice, or you could fail to make the choice. And in fact, there's a right choice to make. And in fact, you make that right choice. That's what courage seems to be. It requires the possibility of not being courageous in order to manifest at all. Minus any of the choices, what do you have? 
you have something like obedience instead. And I think I'm closer to that characterologically. That is, you know, I, I came close to dying a good number of times. And I'm living uh, essentially on, in my grace time now uh, by virtue of my last uh, foray into mortality. And uh, as such, you know, in the days when I'm able to remember all of this, uh, my way of proceeding uh, is informed by the fact that I have very little choice. Uh, I've seen the end of my life. It came very close. And it's cast a shadow over all the subsequent days. And so I'm simply obedient now to the fact that I'm living a little longer than I was probably going to. And, you know, my obligation is to translate that into, into what I, whatever I do every day or try to or try to remember it, or try to recover from failing to remember it, and so on. And this is why I'm not particularly courageous. I'm, I'm obedient when I'm high-functioning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm obedient. And maybe that's the source of the, the kind uh, acknowledgement you, you ascribe to me. But, you know, not to be disingenuous, so I'll, maybe I'll end the answer with this. I don't see myself in the terms that you've described, but I do remember, and I, I, I hope I didn't tell this brief story last time we spoke, uh, but if, it's, if I'm repeating myself, so be it. I'm 66 and it happens. <laughs> um, I was waiting out an introduction. So I was appearing live in the good old days when you could appear live and the room was full of people and everybody was facing in my direction and I was sitting in the corner of the stage, and I was being introduced, and the introduction was very kind, uh, a little excessive, which never does the speaker any favors, I have to say, at least not in Anglo North America. If you are heavily praised in your introduction, many of the people in the audience will fold their arms and wait to see how much of that could possibly be true about you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you start three steps behind where you could have been if they just had said your name and your rank and your serial number. I'll remember that when I introduce you for this uh, podcast episode. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. So the woman was very kind, though. And uh, during the course of her uh, accolades, she described me as a visionary. Now, I'm alert in a general sort of way to the consequences that accrue around someone who's called a visionary. It tends not to work out very well for the visionary, <laughs> Lar largely because there's not a lot of people who are hoping that the visionary prevails, because it tends to be the case, particularly in a time like ours, that if you occupy the visionary chair, you are a dispenser of grim tidings for the most part. After all, you're not inventing. That's not what a visionary is. You're seeing. That means it's what you're reporting is already so. So that's, what, that's the nature of prophecy, you see, is a, a very acute weather report. Nuts. It doesn't have any notion about the future at its front. It has a, 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 an acute willingness to testify to the present circumstances. So, so I stood up and tried to dig myself out of the, the gilded hole that she had dug for me and thanked her very much and then said something of the following. Now, I was, I was described as a visionary in the introduction, and I know it's meant kindly, but I'd like to back away from the word, mainly because I'm not sure I recognize myself in the function as best as I can understand it. On the other hand, you could describe me as a divisionary, a word that I've never heard used in the English language, but I heard it when she said it. I heard divisionary is much closer uh, a description of what I've been able to manage uh, when I'm firing on all cylinders. And it's this sets me to some extent apart from my fellows, you see. And there's a high degree of solitude and loneliness that ensues from the function, from taking up the function. 
And the thing is that nobody asks you to be divisive in a time that's already plenty troubled enough. So if you're going to occupy the, the position, you do so as a self-appointed functionary. And that's what I've become. So you're very, very prone to attacks, <clears throat> excuse me, from, from all sides about, uh, you know, you're doing the work that you've assigned to yourself. And I suppose guilty is charged. But I would just add a PS and say, I didn't invent the troubles that I'm responding to that have turned into the real authors of the spirit work that accrues to my generation. I didn't invent any of it. I just, on the better days, do my best to be accurate about what I saw and what I'm continuing to see. And I think I probably learned that from working with dying people when the last thing they wanted to know was what was really happening with them. And so my responsibility, and I took it as such, was to faithfully craft a language wherein the realities of their lives could appear and could be available to them in what I said to them. And so the last thing I was was comforting, and the first thing I was was faithful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> sometimes I feel a strong need to disconnect from feeling so much all the time, worrying, grieving, reading, trying to do good work in a dysfunctional culture. And I wish I could say that I disconnect through some wonderful form of yoga or meditation or something of the kind. Mm -hmm. But the embarrassing truth is that my favorite way of disconnection is through following the National Hockey League <laughs> and watching my favorite team, which happens to be the New York Rangers, after my days of living in New York. Mm -hmm. So being a good Canadian, do you watch any hockey or do you ever feel a need to disconnect from the troubles of our times in some other way? Well answer to the hockey question is from time to time, yes. Uh, and it's, it's a childhood affiliation, which uh, simply can't be defended. It's, it's a tribal affiliation. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I admire the game tremendously. As a, I played it into my late 50s. In fact, I played hockey long enough that I was able to play on the same team with my son, which was a wonderful moment, although I'm not sure anybody would describe me as playing at that, at that juncture. I was probably hanging on for dear life and my son was very good. <laughs> uh, as far as the disconnecting thing goes, um, I understand, I think, the impulse to do something about the input. So, so let's, let me be kind for a second and acknowledge on all our behalf that the infernal machinery that you and I are employing right now to be able to go back and forth and that you'll employ later on in order to issue this uh, interview and so on is a kind of fire hose. And it's a fire hose that's inserted directly into our, our uh, discernment places inside us. And it's open full throttle all the time. And this is not a universal constant through all of human history that people have been on the receiving end of unsupportable amounts of information, allegation, tirade, and the rest. It's very, very recent. And there's no adaptive ability that we have available to us to make the onslaught of information a livable condition. Never mind something that contributes, you know, deeply to your capacity to uh, to act on behalf of the near future and the people that are coming. So we're at a at a critical disadvantage that we're so successful at our proliferation that we can barely bear the presence of ourselves and you know all of the inferences that ensue. So th this obviously leads to a sense of 
turn it on, turn it off, open the tap, close the tap, that kind of sensibility. My own inclinations are not to turn it off. No. Now, I'm not, I'm not a very plugged-in guy, but I think probably what I do instead is shift the, the, the nature of my focus, the quality of my focus. Sometimes it's a hard focus and sometimes it's a soft one. Sometimes it's um, uh, desperately attending to the particulars that are immediate and that surround me. And other times there's a kind of uh, middle distance stare that I can cultivate that doesn't give me a, a sense of relief about what you were articulating. It just... It just shifts my abilities. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm lucky to have it, you know. Uh, I'm not sure that all of these things came to me when I was working with dying people, but a good number of them seem to have done. Now, w when you're sitting beside someone who is, who is seriously and incontrovertibly dying, you can talk about the dying if you think that this is helpful, but you will soon come to an understanding that speaking about the dying is not the same thing as conducting yourself as if what's happening is happening. In other words, rather than having this person's dying being the focus of your meeting, you could shift the focus to the point where you speak as if they're dying, instead of about their dying. And that takes a tremendous amount of translation, semantic translation and, and you know, idiosyncratic translation, and especially spiritual and philosophical translation. You ask yourself, what do you owe a fellow human being who's at the cliff edge of his or her sanity and capacity to proceed and ability to proceed? How, how do you do it? And the answer is, among others, is that you don't ask them to continually revisit the, uh, the precipice that they're inhabiting anyway. And you don't speak to distract them from it. You just allow your way of being with them to be informed by the understanding that they're there and you're not. Your fellow humans now separated by the very near future and what it's and how it's going to claim one of you and so ironically you who are the surviving one of the, these two people are not in any more advantaged position because you're not sure how to conduct yourself either and now the question of let's call it the primordial etiquette of mortality is something that both of you have to find. So you're not counseling somebody anymore. You're allowing the frailties of human life to counsel you and gather you into an understanding of what the radical etiquette of being citizens of a troubled time actually ask of you. And people who are dying are secretly, deeply grateful for not being excommunicated from the etiquette of the living too soon. They're grateful to remain included, even though the time for active participation is drawing to a close. And that's what I was able to do finally, when I learned that that's what was needed. And lo and behold, it's a transferable skill. So, so it tends to work amongst the living and not just amongst the dying. Thank you. As time is running out on this conversation, here's a question about time. Okay. We're taught at an early age that time runs from the left to the right on a linear scale. Right. What is your understanding of what time is and how it works? <laughs> you remind me of uh, an interview that I, I did very close to where I'm sitting right now in the little local hippie radio station in the village just down the highway from here. And uh, in fact, I told the story on the last record uh, that we made uh, 
Gregory and I called, and it's called Hippie Radio if anybody wants to listen to the reference. And I sat down, they wanted, they said they wanted to talk to me about dying and all the rest. I sat down and the very first question he asked me went like this. I've been listening to your interviews and so on. And it seems to me that you know how to slow down time. Is that true? (laughs) (laughs) That's what he asked. So, um, (laughs) of course, the the correct answer is no. It's also the right answer. And it's also the best answer to give. It, It may not be the fullest answer. Okay, so here's my take as best as I've been able to figure it out about time. And I'm, I'm very much aided by the fact that I'm looking out the window as I'm talking to you, and I'm going to refer to the very river that's 100 feet away from me right now. Now, in my corner of the world when I was growing up, <laughs> there was never such a thing as time class at school. I don't ever remember it being spoken about. I think the reason for that is not because everybody ignored it, but because time time class was so constant and so common that it didn't need a particular time in order to appear. Time class was being taught all the time. By which I mean this, just as you characterized it, we learned that, I don't know about the left to right, I know that's a, that's a Western literacy reference, but... Uh, Certainly, we were taught that time had a kind of rhythm to it, a kind of movement to it that was not really metronomic, not that regular, but absolutely unerring. And in the times when we thought that time wasn't moving in that unerring way, we were the ones who were confused. Time itself was never confused and always made its way in a particular kind of direction. And this is the important part of it to me. It always moved to the future. That's where it was going. Now, this is a confusing thing to say in English, that I'm, I'm speaking about a tense in spatial terms. Okay, but there's a reason for that, so bear with me. So now, with that in mind, because everybody knows in the West that time goes to the future, that everything's heading from the already has been to the not yet. That's what hope's all about. That's what optimism is all about. It, it's about the, 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 what's coming, right? And what's coming is always deemed to be up ahead, which is to say that you're facing it if you're sane and well-adjusted. And otherwise, you're, quote, wallowing in the past. Oh, the prejudices are just legion when you start to look at them. Lingering in the past, lost in the past, dwelling in the past. All of these things are are, uh, basically forbidden to you. Looking forward to the future, to your potential, to living up to your potential and so on. All these things are held in high esteem. So let's do this. Now, I never do... uh, what do they call them? Not visionary, visioning? Visualization. Visualization exercise. I never do this kind of stuff, but I'm going to do it now. So I'm going to sound like an amateur, but here we go. So let's step out into the river that's just 100 feet away from me as I'm talking to you now. We don't have to go very deep. It's not a total immersion kind of exercise. Just, just roll up your pants to your knees. That will suffice. So now you've done so, and we walk out until you can feel the water just behind your knees, you know, making its way. Even if you're a blind person, I shouldn't say even, as a blind person, you may be more capable of this exercise than the rest of us, having had to do so many times before. You're standing in the water. By virtue of the fact that it's a river, it has a current. And after some stillness, even with no visual information, I would be able to ask you, which direction is the river flowing to? And you would be able to point to it simply by virtue of the feeling of the water passing you by against your skin. Okay. Now, I would say to you, would you please face in the direction that the river is going? And you would rotate and face that way. 
so that you could feel the current on the back of your legs making its way around your legs and moving on without you, temporarily. And then I would change the terms of reference just slightly and I say, now, what time are you facing? Not what direction, like east, west, north, south, but rather what time, past or present or future. And if you don't think about it much, and if you think this is a, a parable or an analogy or a metaphor, you're going to answer faithfully as a denizen of the West that the river is heading to the future. And then I would try to help you consider the alternative this way. Now, if you would open your eyes and look down at the water, because it's a living river, there's all kinds of stuff in the water all the time. Most of it is obeying the current, which is to say, most of it is heading in the direction that you're facing. Leaves and branches and, you know, dead flies and uh, I don't know what all. is, And it's moving past you t- out that way. Now, what do we call the place where everything that's been ends up. Let me say that again. There's a, there's a, a place in either in our mind, let's just say in our mind for now. And that's where everything that's been ends up. Everything that's been is otherwise known as history. Where is history? Well, it's in the past. That's what we've learned. Okay, so it's gone. Well, it's at, it's at least past. That's for sure. Okay. And everything that is currently is heading there eventually. So far as we know, yes, that's what's happening. Okay. Then if the, if the river that we're talking about is actually the river of time... And everything that's in it is passing you by and heading in the same direction. And everything that's in the the river that you're observing passing you by is what has been until this moment. When is it headed towards? And I think the answer is inescapable. Everything is heading towards the past. It's going to where everything else has gone which is the same self-same thing that will happen to you and to me when it's our turn to no longer be alive. We will head towards the past, towards everything else and everyone else that has been. We're doing that now. Time goes to the past. There is no future. When the future materializes and manifests, that's called the present. And when it's had its moment, well, that's called the past. And one of the great comforting realizations from this is that you will more or less unerringly join everything that has been before you with minimum effort on your part to do so. The river of time itself will bear you there. If you happen to be an Anglo-North American like me, that could fill you with all kinds of dread because all of your self-determination schemes suddenly look paltry and foolish. Well, (laughs) that's because they are paltry and foolish. And real radical obedience to the epistemological realities of being a human being include the realization that you are headed towards the past. And, you know, the caveat could be, please proceed accordingly. And, you know, in this interview, and generally speaking, that's what I try to do. I try to be mindful constantly that the past is waiting. It's far from being gone. It's the real cradle. 
of all our capacities. And the willingness to proceed towards the past is what grants us what I've come to call the radicalized citizenship required of us in a troubled time. It's not on behalf of an unborn generation. We are dying unto those generations that preceded us. That's where our, our uh, kind of psychic circuitry comes from. And that's what informs it. At least, if you're willing to consider the real possibility that you don't need a future to be a faithful, enduring human who's participating actively in his or her times. All you need a sense is a sense of the near past, which you are about to join. And so the notion of our, of our, the frailty of our belonging, what, uh, what Leonard Cohen so gorgeously called, he said, Oh, my love, be not afraid. We are so lightly here. It is in love that we are made. In love we disappear. He is talking about the past, I think. And, well, he knows now better than me. I'd like to thank you deeply for taking the time to sit with me around the campfire and wonder aloud about these things. It's a pleasure, man. It's always a pleasure. And I'll go further and say, there's something about the way you come to these things that cultivates in me some capacity that's rarely called upon. So I'm just enormously grateful that some vague skillfulness, unemployed so much of the time, that's been entrusted to me, appears as if by magic, as a consequence of the things that you're willing to wonder about. So on behalf of my self-improvement, I thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm wishing for you a good blend of sunshine and rain upon your crops and upon your soul. And yours. Thank you so much. Thank you. The Campfire Podcast is a community-supported endeavor. If you'd like to make a financial contribution to enable us to keep doing what we do, please consider one of the following two options. The first one is to go to the box office at the Campfire Stories website and make a one-time donation. If you're listening to this from within the site, you'll find all the information right here on the page. If you're listening through an external podcast platform, you'll need first to navigate to campfire-stories.org to be able to support us. Which is not a bad idea anyway, because while you're there, you'll be able to watch all of our films too. The second way that you can support us is by becoming a monthly donor via our Patreon page. <laughs> 
at patreon.com slash Matthias Olsen. That is p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash m-a-t-t-i-a-s-o-l-s-s-o-n. Thank you. Your support is not merely something to be thankful for as a sort of by the way side thing. It is the thing that makes me and us able to faithfully keep steering this ship onwards through the fog. And for that, you have my gratitude. Be well until the next time. <laughs>